Uh, Genesis 25, begin about verse uh, 30. Genesis 25, verse 30. And in that passage there, you uh, find two Old Testament characters that uh, are prominent in the Old Testament, and I mentioned the New Testament several times. And about verse 30 there, Esau had come into Jacob, and he says to Jacob in so many words, he says, feed me of that uh, same red pottage. He was faint, and it was red pottage, kind of like a chili, and therefore his name was called Eden, which means red. And uh, Jacob uh, talked to him and, and treated him, and he said uh, in so many words in English, what did you give me? And he said, well, what do you want? And Jacob said, what you got? And he said, well, i got a birthright. And Jacob said to him, swear that you give me your birthright. Now, none of them, 31, 32, and 33, he swore to him and gave him his birthright. And the Bible said, uh, so uh, Esau uh, uh, despised his birthright. And he got him some bread out of it, some lentils, some hot kidney beans, and some bread. And the closing statement in the chapter says, Thus Esau despised his birthright. And that thing there is a very important thing in Scripture, evidently, because the Holy Spirit mentions that thing on two other occasions. And when the Holy Spirit mentions a thing three times, the Word of God, it must be important. Matter of fact, it mentions it more than that. In the book of Hebrews, it says that uh, Esau saw the place of repentance and found it not, though he saw it carefully with tears. That's one place. Uh, then he says in another place, in Romans chapter 9, verse 13, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Then he says in another place, Malachi chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Then he says in another place in the book of Hebrews, lest there be any uh, profane person among you like Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And so it's an important thing, that transaction that took place there. And we know it's real important because the Lord mentioned that thing three more times after it took place, and then he mentioned it there. So all in all, it was four times that thing was mentioned. must have been terribly important. Now that uh, thing right there is a picture of a man selling out. And my message tonight is on the man that sold out. Uh, you take Esau as he, as he was, he had some of the greatest privileges that a man ever had. And the decision he made there was rash, and it was foolish, and it was carnal, and it was irretrievable. By that I mean you couldn't take it back. I mean, once the thing was done, it was done. And there's no way to take the thing back. Now, when Esau sold out his birthright, he gave up, first of all, the Abrahamic blessing. The Abrahamic blessing. A God said to Abraham, Bless are those that bless thee, and curse those that curse thee. And that thing went from Abraham to Isaac, and from Isaac to Jacob, and it could have gone Abraham to Isaac, and Isaac to Esau. He despised the Abrahamic blessing, which is the greatest uh, protection a man could have. How'd you like to have God bend over the bottoms of heaven, put his arm around you, and say, look here, everybody that blesses you, I'll bless. And everybody that curses you, I'll curse. Boy, well, you, you couldn't get protection like that from the government. That sort of despise the greatest protection a man could have, and that isn't all. Uh, he, he despised the greatest honor, the greatest honor that could come to a man. The greatest honor from a Bible standpoint that possibly could come to a man would be in the line of Christ and be in the line that brought forth the Savior of this world. And did you know that uh, Esau, when he sold his birthright, he sold his chance to be in the line of Jesus Christ, the messianic line. The line comes Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah. And it could have gone Abraham, Isaac, Esau, and one of his boys. He gave up his privilege to be in the, the line of Jesus Christ, to be in the line that was connected with the seed of a woman, the seed of Israel, the only begotten, the firstborn of God, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, he gave that up. For well, that's more for me. And the Bible said he despised his birthright. When he gave up that birthright, he gave up something else. He gave up the right to preach. Now, in the Old Testament, that's prophesied. In the New Testament, that's preaching. Of the testimony of Jesus Christ, the spirit of prophecy. And uh, when he sold out that birthright, he gave up the right to preach. And that's the greatest privilege a man ever had. 
The greatest privilege a man ever had is the privilege to preach the word. And that's the greatest calling a man ever had. Don't ever despise your calling. I don't care if you don't have a cent to your name, you're down there eating rice and three days a week and canned tuna fish and crackers and coffee with no sugar and doesn't look like the bill's going to get paid, doesn't look like you're going to get graduate or get a place to preach. Don't ever despise the call to preach. The greatest calling the Lord can lay on you. I remember one time when I was uh, up there at school and going through some tough times and things weren't right and nothing was right, brother. I mean nothing. I'm in, the, in there in the crater trying to study French and, and German and Hebrew and Greek cards all at one time with children all over the place. Nothing was right there either. And those dark days, I got put it down the jumps a good many times, stay up all night trying to get my lessons. And I went to Dr. Bob Sr. one time at a private conference. I went to him three or four times while I was up there and laid the card on the table. And he, you know what he said? He said, why, Pete? He said, why, Pete? You know, he said, you ought to just be so happy. Could God call a man like you to preach that you couldn't think about anything else? <laughs> and you know, I never thought about that, you know, about a couple of years later. And then that thing began to sink through. Did you, know it's a, did you know it's a privilege to be called a priest? You say, folks don't have respect for preachers. It's still a privilege to be called a priest. You say, well, preachers are sorry a lot. It's still a privilege to be called a priest. And God doesn't give it to everybody, brother. You know why a lot of fellows aren't called to preach? Because God couldn't trust them with a call. They wouldn't preach nothing. And I tell you, if you've got that privilege, you've got one of the highest privileges there is. I wouldn't trade places tonight with the President of the United States or any general in the Army right now tonight. Small job. Well, let the kids take the small job. You take the big one. <laughs> And the big one, his brother, is preaching that word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not. I wouldn't trade place with him. But Esau would. And listen, Esau gave up the right to preach. And that's one of the greatest privileges God ever gave a man. We despise that birthright. But he gave up God's favor. And that's the greatest blessing a man ever, man ever had, to be in favor with God. I'd like to be in good standing with God. God said, Jacob, have I loved. Esau, have I hated. He gave up God's favor. He didn't care what God thought about him. God, you know what I think about those fellas? Fellas said, what? The Lord said, I love that fella. How do you feel about that one? I hate him. Now, God, you don't hate people. I hate him. But now, God, you don't hate the sinner. You hate the sin. I hate him. But now, Lord, that isn't Christian. <laughs> Lord says, who are you telling me what's Christian what isn't? Jacob, I'm our Lord. Esau, have I hated he said, it's wrong to hate God, does not I hate that one right there. He saw. He said it in Malachi chapter 1. He said it in Romans chapter 9. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. There's one kind of man God can't stand. And when I say God can't stand him, I'm not talking about, it. I'm not talking about his sins. I'm talking about him. And God said, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now, why did he hate him? Because old Esau didn't give a foot what God thought about him. He said, God, I don't care what you think about me. I'm going to get me something to eat. And he, when he sold out, he sold out. When this fellow sold out, first of all, I used to say <coughs> in the passage, <coughs> in the passage, it was a carnal decision. By a carnal decision, I mean it was a decision that was based on sight and not by faith. I mean it was a decision that had to do with the flesh. The flesh needed something. The flesh wanted something. The Bible says to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And that carnal decision he made was a carnal decision because it had to do with the flesh. He wanted something to eat. His flesh craved something. It was a carnal decision because the flesh said, I've got to have it. I've got to have it. I've got to have it. And the two, some of you young people are going to ruin your life that way. You've got to have it. You've got to have it. You've got to have it. You won't listen to mom and daddy. Some of you know your mothers and daddies made a wreck out of the lives, don't you? Don't you? Don't you? I don't, don't sit there and yawn and lie or turn around and act like you got mine or something else. Some of you young people, you know mom and daddy made a left mess out of their life. Don't you? Amen, you do. And you know, because that you know what you do, you won't listen to what they say. You're going to do it your way. See? You know what you're going to do? You're going to make a bigger mess than they did. That's right. You know why you're going to make a bigger mess? That's just a natural trend, brother. The natural trend is just downhill. <laughs> I saw a fellow over there in the 
in general, scanned a general hospital sitting in a wheelchair about 50 years old, first one he'd ever been in. He was rolling that thing up down the hallway trying to get used to it. And I heard him laugh and said to one of the nurses, he said, well, look at here. He said, I can go, I can go, I can go backwards easy to this thing and I can go forward. And I thought to myself, isn't that like folks? You know, you can go backwards easy and you can go forward. And some of you young people turn up your nose at mom and daddy and won't listen to what they have to say and don't take advice from them. You know what you're going to do? You're going to make the same mistake they made or you're going to make it bigger and better and messier, brother. And you know why? Because that old flesh says, got to have it, got to have it, got to have it, got to have it. You don't have to have it. He said, my God shall supply all your need through his riches and glory but Christ Jesus. That's what Lot did. Lot looked out across there and said, got to have it, got to have it, got to have it. Boy, I could make a killer down there, pass your land, make good money, make good money, make a killer. Got to have it. He got it. He got it. He got it. You take Anman, raped his own sister. You know that's over there in the second Samuel. Raped his own sister. You know the flesh says, got to have something, got to have something, got to have something. Anman didn't tell his flesh to shut up, didn't put the flesh down, didn't obey the scriptures. It says if you took the spirit, you mortified the deeds of the body, you shall live. Got to have it. Got to have it. He got it. He got it. He got it. He got killed. His brother killed him. That five fellow stabbed him while he was drinking, sitting at a table. It was a carnal decision. Demas had to have it. Old Demas over there in the Second Timothy chapter four, before Paul died, uh, the Lord, uh, Paul said about Demas, Demas hath forsaken me. What was his trouble, Paul? He loved this present world. Demas got up there near the jail with Paul, and Demas saw the handwriting on the wall. And he said, I can stick with that fellow so far, but if that fellow's going to go to jail, i got to part company. Hurt my testimony. <laughs> and so back he went in the world, having loved this present world. And let me tell you something. The Christian that can just go to a certain place with you and has got to get off because it's going to hurt his influence to other Christians or bust up his fellowship or bust up his political connections or bust up his relatives, ain't worth shooting. How about going all the way, brother? My boy got down there in the jail and he turned around and said, Demas has forsaken me. What Demas was troubled. He loved this present world. Had to have it. Had to have it. Had to have it. He got it. He got it. He got it and lost his crown, lost his reward, lost his inheritance, everything else. It's a carnal mistake that Esau made. It was a carnal choice, and that isn't all. It was a rash choice. By a rash choice, I mean there's some carnal choices you can make that are necessary. I mean... You might make a choice tonight to go home and get something to eat. You haven't had nothing to eat all day. And that's flesh. Yeah, that's just flesh as it can be, but you might need it. I mean, just because it's carnal doesn't mean the thing's always wrong. Paul said one time, it's the Gentile's duty to minister carnal things to the people that minister spiritual things to them, see? Just because it's a carnal decision, that don't ruin it, but it was a rash decision. In other words, the flesh said, I've got to have it now. I've got to have it now. Wait a while. Now. A little later. Wait. Now. Can't live without it. Got to have it. Today. It was a rash decision. It was a carnal decision. It was a rash decision. You can get along without it. Rest, it. rest in God. Wait on God. Watch and pray. Listen, you got time. you got all eternity, brother. If you're saved, you're going to dwell someday in eternity where there isn't going to be any more time. Don't, don't, you don't have to have everything right now. You can get some of it on the other side. I think God's giving you enough now to keep you fairly happy if you're not just a, a natural-born chronic driver. You can get it later. You can get it later. No hurry on it. Uh, when uh, Sir Russell was a... He was an Englishman that got uh, put on the chopping block back in the rain in one of those uh, queens like Bloody Mary or one of those kings like Bloody Mary back in England. And when he got to the chopping block, he took off his wristwatch and handed the executioner and said, you can take care of that. So where I'm going, I won't need it anymore. <laughs> so he said, well, you take care of the time. I'm going to step out here with the don't keep time anymore. And someday you're going to step out with the don't keep time anymore, and, and then you'll feel like a fool if you made a decision like that. You know, one time David did a thing like that. He got all upset about that thing, all upset about that thing, and that quest said, you got to have it now. you got to have it now. Right now! He got it. He got it. You know what the Lord said to him through Nathan? He said, listen, Nathan. Nathan came and said, listen, David. He said, thus saith the Lord. I gave you this, and I gave you that, and I gave you this, and I gave you that, and I gave you this, and this, and this, 
And if that hadn't been enough, I'd have given you that, that, and that. Now, how come you despise my commandment and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite and killed him with a sword? And then he got it, and he got some more with it, brother. He got some dead children with a thing, and a torn up king with a thing, and everything else. You know what the trouble with that thing was? It was a rash decision. A rash decision. And that isn't all. It was a foolish decision. It was a foolish decision because it was all out of proportion to the values involved. In better words, I, I wouldn't blame a fellow for making a quick decision, a rash decision, and sometimes a carnal decision, if there was anything to it. But what in the world can you get out of that decision? One bowl of chili beans for a birthright. One bowl of chili beans for the right to preach. And one bowl of chili beans, one temporary satisfaction of the flesh in about 30 minutes. Brother, at the expense of the right to preach and the right to prophesy and get the Abrahamic blessing and be in God's favor and be in the line of Christ, my God, what a swap. What a swap, brother. For a man would do a thing like that. No wonder the Lord said, Jacob, have I loved, Esau, have I hated. The thing was all out of proportion. It was all out of value. There was, you couldn't compare them. Paul said one time, the present sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Paul said, our present light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh the far more exceeding weight of glory, while we look at those things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. There's no way to compare them. It was a foolish decision. Very foolish. You might, uh, you might not... I don't understand a Christian getting a chance to make a killing on real estate. That's carnal. And making the decision in 24 hours. That's rash. But if you made a couple of thousand dollars off it, I guess you couldn't call it foolish. At least not as the world calls it. But that decision was a carnal m mistake, and it was a rash mistake, and that is no, that thing was a foolish mistake. It was a foolish mistake. All out of proportion. A rich young woman lay dying one time, and... She lay there and she kept saying, call them back, call them back, call them back. And somebody said, call back what? And she said, the hours and years I wasted. The hours and years I wasted. The foolishness, the time you wasted. Doing what? Taking care of the flesh. Taking care of the flesh. Satisfying the flesh. Call them back, call them back. Call back what? The hours, the days, the years. You know what Lord Byron said? Lord Byron was one of the... My man, he'd make Errol Flynn look like a fink. I mean, Lord Byron, he was a cutter. He'd go. Uh, Lord Byron traveled all over the world all his life, never had to have a job. Errol Flynn had to work for a living. Small game. Uh, listen, Lord Byron never had to work a day in his life. He didn't have to make movies to get an income. Lord Byron traveled all over the world all his life, wrote poems, got in sword duels, got in pistol duels, uh, drank champagne out of a slipper, had an affair with his own sister that had all the capitals of Europe. Uh, standing on the ears, wondering what in the world was going on. He lived as reckless and wild and profligate a life as any reprobate ever did. You know what he said when he died? He said, I have 12 happy days in my life. He said, I've had 12 of them. 12 happy days. That was his testimony. Died young. Died up around 40, 41 someplace. And he said, I've had 12 happy days. Thank you for that word of testimony, brother. That's the word of testimony of the man who makes a rash, carnal, foolish decision and bases it on now instead of eternity. A man said one time, he said, never sacrifice the immediate on the altar of the permanent. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Thy word, O Lord, forever is settled in heaven. Don't ever sell them out. Don't ever swap them out. You fellows are called a priest. Don't ever sell out to a bunch of liberals, a bunch of modernists. Don't ever sell out to a bunch of Southern Baptists. They will give you a church, fella, if you come to one of our schools and go to one of their schools and dump your money in their coffer to pay for the girls' smoking room. And dump your money in the coffer to give Nell Spray an offering when he comes in. And dump your money in the coffer to give Martin Luther King an offering when he comes in. And dump your money in the fun and have him hire Blue Baron and his dance band to play for the spring frolic. Don't do it! Brother... Don't trade your birthright for a mess of pottage. If God called you to preach and that's your birthright, then be the best preacher ever was. If you ought to get the place where your seams put on your shirts and you got patches in your uh, pants and your shoes are unpolished and you're living off rice and grits, brother, 
He's the best cotton tricking preacher in the world. And don't sell out to him. Don't sell out to him. I don't care if they drive Cadillacs, have their shoes polished, everything just in place, never have a wrinkled collar, never have a spot on the tire, brother. I'll preach them. But don't sell out to them. Don't sell out to them. They'll come around to you. They'll come around to you. And you'll be tempted when you get in the ministry to sell out to get results. And sell out to get a congregation. To sell out to set records. Don't sell out. Don't sell out. You have to stay poor and small and miserable all your life. Stay poor and small and miserable in their sight. But don't sell out. Don't sell out. You know, one time some men came to J. Frank Norris in the hotel room in Fort Worth, Texas. And they came up to him and they were all big shots from the convention. And they said, J. Frank, if you're going like you're going, you're going to have to cut down the sap and get a place to preach. You're going to ruin yourself preaching the way you're preaching. And they tried to get him to go along and support the program, you know, and quit exposing uh, sin in Waco and infidelity at the University of Chicago. And you know what Frank Norris told those men? It was the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Waco, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Houston, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Dallas, and some of their friends. You know what he told them? He said, boys, I want to tell you something. I may die unsung of and unheard of with no publicity, and I'm a dying of my name, and my name never recorded anywhere, but I, I'm not going to sell out, and you know, the Lord just might swing it around some other day. I might just live to preach your funeral. And he preached all three of them. He preached all three of them. Don't sell out. Don't sell out. It'll get tough. It'll get hard. I've had to come around and say, now, if you just do this, we'll set you up. If you just do that, we'll set you up. If you just quit doing this, we'll set you up. If you just feel nicer. If you just feel quieter. If you just don't, we won't be so negative. If you just won't mention this. If you just won't mention that. See, you know what that is? Potties, brother. Potties, brother. I smell the stink. Why, listen, why should I sell out to get a meal? Anybody in America can get a meal. Now, if you're a bum at a transit, you can get a meal. You can get out of Salvation Army and get a meal, a bowl of lentils and hot porridge and chili and beans. You don't have to sell out. You know, the folks, the only thing the flesh can produce is corruption. Do you know why? Because it's, it's corrupt. It's corrupt. That was a foolish decision, all out of proportion to the value of that thing, because it had to do with the flesh, and the flesh is corruptible. I think about the, the I think about the, I think about the most famous, wisest man that ever lived. I know a man one time that had ten private swimming pools. I don't know anybody in Hollywood who's got that. Do you? Ten swimming pools, and one of them is big in this building. You don't know of anybody in Hollywood like that. Elvis Presley, he'd hire him to take out the garbage for him. And you know that famous man, do you know he was so rich that he wouldn't even have anything in his house made out of silver? That was for the poor folk. The Bible said everything he had was covered with gold. You think about a man that drinks out of a gold goblet and eats out of a gold plate and calls people to wash his dishes and has to put a guard on them to keep them, steal, keep them from stealing the gold wear. <laughs> and gold spoons and gold silvers and gold... Go, uh, gold knives and gold forks over there washing that gold stuff. And you know what he said? He said he had his own dance band. Got him men and women singers. Had his, hired his own orchestra to come in and play for him all by himself. You don't have anybody in Hollywood that rich. Howard Hughes? Make a bellboy out of him in a place like that. And you know something? That wisest man that ever lived, not, he not only did that, he did whatever he wanted to do. So Howard Hughes had about four wives. This fellow had a thousand. Yes, this fellow had a thousand. You couldn't find a bigamous wife in anywhere. You couldn't find the ten biggest bigamists in Hollywood and come anywhere near him. He had a thousand of them. You know what he said when he got all through? He said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, say the preacher. You know what he found out? He found that the only thing the flesh can produce is corruption because the flesh is corrupt. And if you sow to it, you reap corruption. That was a foolish decision. That was a rash decision. And last of all, that decision was irretrievable. By that I mean I, he couldn't change it once he got the thing taken care of. Once he got that decision made, he couldn't go back on it. Uh, the Bible says over there in Hebrews he saw the place of repentance and he saw it carefully with tears and the Bible says he didn't find it. He didn't find it. 
It was irretrievable. It was revocable. Irrevocable. He couldn't take the thing back. Once the thing was done, it was done. It was a temporal decision, a timely decision. And I'll tell you something else about that. Older, older Esau, he never even knew what God had done to him until he died. Now, he was mad about that deal. Well, a little bit later on, you know, when he lost his blessing too. But he didn't realize what God had done to him until he died. You know what God did to Esau? He gave him a lot of carnal stuff. And one day Esau showed up with Jacob out there in the road, and Jacob said, help yourself, help yourself, help yourself. And Esau said, I've got enough. He was satisfied. Esau said, I have enough, my brother. He was satisfied. You know what Esau did? Esau went through his whole life thinking God was using him, and God never turned around and looked at him. One time. You know what old Esau thought? He thought because the material blessings came, and he could see the material prosperity, that was proof that God was using him and working through him. And God said, Jacob, have I loved, and Esau, have I hated. Wouldn't that be terrible to go through all your life thinking God was using you, and then they get the judgment and have them say, who are you? Now, God, every turn around, look at old Esau. You say, well, if he's a Christian, the Lord knew him. I know my sheep and called them by name. Well, that's right, but I think sometimes the Lord has some anonymous sheep. <laughs> I think he has some sheep that he don't know too well. I've met people like that before all the life God has used them, and the Lord wasn't doing a thing in the world with them. They're just making a living. I get a magazine called Christianity Today, and I don't know who sends it to me. I'm sure it's someone in this town that wishes me well and wishes I could straighten up a little bit, you know, and be a better preacher. And uh, it's Christianity Today is a real high-class magazine. It's kind of a Presbyterian Episcopal, uh, kind of a CBM, uh, C, uh, Andrew Carnegie, uh, Earl Stanley Jones kind of magazine, a little bit of Arkenjay, you know, and Mahatma Gandhi sprinkled through it. And that, that magazine, Christianity Today, you know, when it has an article about God in it, it's always one of these articles that begins, don't forget next week's article, a most important, timely article on the, the attributes of God. And then the article will come out. And the article will be, you know, by some great Christian, supposedly. And it will begin uh, in uh, comprehending the attributes of God. One must begin with the psychological attitude and approach uh, that the dynamic thrust uh, with which the mind reaches out to grasp these are realities. And you read that stuff and you think, well, that stuff hurt. God never looked at it. For the right man stuff like he'd written some great, big, heavy, preponderous, earth-shaking, seminary, quaking article, and the Lord never even turned around and said, hey, <laughs> never even looked at him. Never, just hot air, brother, just hot air. I, I get letters. You know, once they find a preacher's mailbox, they got him. And I go in that mailbox down there. I never go in there. There isn't at least ten of them in there. And if I leave it for a week, it's all falling out the back end, you know, in somebody else's box, and they got it wrapped up in a rubber band. And I get all kinds of things from all Roberts and all kinds of things from A.A. Allen and all kinds of things, you know, from Herbert Armstrong. And by the way, Herbert Armstrong now has a missionary program set up with a little old paper, a lot of photographs in it on cheap paper, and his name is not on it. But the fellow who's running that thing is the man who draws the cartoons in that magazine that comes out every month. And uh, have any been getting that thing? Some of God's people have asked me, should I send money to that missionary thing? That's British Israelism, that thing. The little cheap paper printed with a bunch of photographs in it. And they send me all that kind of stuff, you know. We had a fellow come to the church here one time, and I won't mention his name. I wouldn't want to embarrass him, and I wouldn't want to embarrass you if you're a friend of his, but he tuned up his violin while we were praying one time. <laughs> and when he came down the aisle, the invitation, he wanted to know if he could preach next Sunday. I mean, that was the invitation for unsaved people. And he sent me mail all the time. And I get some big letter about this long, and it says, Don't miss my newest book. Don't miss my latest book. You know, I worked 15 years in this book. And at last, I believe God is ready to reveal these startling truths to people. Read the amazing thing that God has showed me. Uh, for the limited time, only three gifts. Uh, send an offering of $15, and you'll also get with it a toothbrush and shaving cream or something else. And you know that fellow, he goes along, he goes along in life, 
Just like he thought was God was using him, I bet God hadn't looked at him twice. And do you know a lot of Christians like that? A lot of Christians like that. A lot of Christian lives are just little old dinky, tricky, slippery things where you just go like this and make friends and get along, don't upset anybody, and just get along, keep in, come coming in, take care of this, and take care of that. God isn't using you, and God is interested in using you. You know what the Lord said? The Lord said, Jacob, have I love. Wasn't Jacob a thief? Yeah, he was. Jacob, have I love. Wasn't he a crook? Yeah, he was. Come think of it, he was. Jacob, have I love. He saw how I hated. Why? 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 You know why? Because old Jacob had an eye for something spiritual. And all he saw could think of was a thing right now. And you want to look out for old man Jacob. Because old man Jacob wants it. He wants it right now. And he can't wait for it. And then someday, are you going to have to face the music? You know where that expression comes from? In the Japanese uh, Philharmonic Orchestra in Tokyo, there was a flute player that rehearsed for the orchestra every time they got together and played with them every time they got together. And nobody knew it, but he wasn't blowing one note on that flute. He was sitting there watching that music and imitating. He couldn't play the flute. And he wanted to play before the emperor. And when the day, a couple of days came around before they were going to play for the emperor, and the director called each man in and to polish up his orchestra, he demanded each man have a personal audition and play his instrument. And he called that flute player in. That flute player said he was sick. And the director postponed the concert for the emperor two months and called him in the next week, and he was sick again. And he called him in the next week, and he was sick again. And finally he went to him and said, What's the matter? And that flute player said, I can't face the music. Of course, he probably said, He's talking about teaching on angel or something like that. But he said, I, I can't face the music. And Folks, I tell you, when you die and get up to heaven, you're going to face the music. And if all you've been doing out here is just going through the motion, so people think you're one of them, and you've just learned the motion, so it appears that you're a spiritual Christian the Lord's really using, then don't forget there comes that great audition day and that great rehearsal when the Lord pulls up the stool and pulls up the music stand and puts the music on and gives you the instrument and you sit down by yourself, and then you play the tune. I wonder, I wonder, is God really using you? And when I say you, I mean every Christian in this building. Is the Lord really using you? Is your life a self-life? Is it just pottage? Or is God really using you? I don't know. I can't tell. The Lord knows. But I wonder, is your name registered in hell? Do the demons know you? If the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in, in heavenly places came down tonight and landed on this earth and got out, would they look you up? Are you on the blacklist? I am the devil showed up tonight and came down a little early, a little ahead of Daniel's 70th week. Does he know you? Are you registered in hell? I mean, are you something that God really used and is well known to the spiritual forces? Or would they just come down and say, well, he's all right, he's a good old fellow, I don't believe he's done anybody any harm, and just let you go by. I wonder. One time the demons were cast out of a man over there in Acts chapter 19, and you know what, uh, you know what the demon said when he got cast out? Uh, he said, uh, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. He knew them, he knew them, but he said, who are you? Who are you? You know what the unclean spirit said? He said, I haven't heard of you before. Don't even know you. You know what that means? That means those fellows had no power over unclean spirits and weren't even close enough to them to get acquainted. But they knew Paul and they knew Jesus. They knew those two. God says in the book, folks, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. I hope that as far as your testimony is concerned and your life is concerned, that God's going to use you like he used Jacob and say, Jacob have I loved. And I hope when you get to heaven, the Lord won't look at you and say, well, you want a sheep, and I died for you. But as far as the way you conducted yourself down there with the permanent immediate, I hate you. I can't stand you. All right, let's stand for prayer. Now, Father, help us to get our eyes off the temporary and the and the immediate things at hand, and 
and the external is the physical, and I've set our affections on things above, and not on things this earth. Lord, we know if this country goes the way it's going, we may have to. And Lord, we don't know what is involved in the future. But uh, irregardless of that, we know where our heart ought to be, and we pray it'll be there. We're thankful the soul will save this week. We're thankful for the decision we made in this church this morning. We pray you'll continue to bless your people throughout this week and give us a great visitation night, Tuesday night, and, and give some of these people souls that haven't won them for months and months, years and years. And Lord, continue to pour out a spirit of revival upon us and edify us and draw us closer to thee. And Lord, help us, Heavenly Father, by your grace to, to put the accent on the permanent and, and let the immediate take care of itself. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Is anybody here tonight? Raise your hand and say, Brother Ruffman, I'm not saved. I'm not a Christian. I'm not even prepared for eternity. If I just step out in eternity tonight, I don't believe I'd even go to be home with God. I don't know where I'd go. I'm not saved. I'm not a Christian. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand? Is there one like that anywhere in the building here tonight? You know why man, most men go to hell? They're just busy down here, taking care of the family, taking care of the flesh. No time for Christ, no time for God. Sacrifice the permanent, the order of the immediate. Old man Jacob, that's the old man in the Christian. That's the old man. If you're unsaved, that's the devil trying to get you to sell your birthright. Is there a hand here tonight? I'm not saved, not a child of God, not prepared for eternity. Pray for me as the one. If not, we'll close. Is the one that we're in the building? All right, Father, bless your word. Let it not return to thee void, but accomplish the purpose wherein do thou send it. For the honor and glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, before we're seated, uh, those who are coming for baptism, if you would, make your way to the room now. Ladies and girls over here on my right, Men and boys over here on my left. And uh, some of you came this morning to make the decision, and perhaps the others tonight that need to make it, you feel free to come. Ladies and girls over here, men and boys over yonder. All right, be seated. Thank you.